Hello, I'm Pastor Steve Aldi, and in my years of counseling believers, I have found that most of the problems that I have been confronted with are based on people seeking to find their satisfaction, fulfillment, and security in this fallen world without considering the reality that is revealed to us in the Word of God, the Bible. We attempt in our fallen natures to find our fulfillment, purpose, and security in the world without God. So I've often asked um, those I'm counseling, how much do you read the Bible? Invariably, their answer is, not as much as I should. And I'm usually thinking, well, that's probably true. You don't read the Bible as much as you should. But the question that I have is, why should we read the Bible? Why should we be reading it? Another question um, I want to ask is because God has created us to find our satisfaction, to find our worth, to find um, our significance in knowing him and glorifying him glorifying him in our enjoyment of him and enjoying his love towards us because this is the case. How do I experience, how do you and I experience an increasing intimate knowledge of God and his love towards us? And these two, these two questions bring out two aspects of the Christian life. One is that there are objective and historic facts in the Bible which require us to use our mental faculties, the ability to read, the ability to think, and the ability to understand. Just face it, if he, God has given us a revelation of himself through a written word, and he's also given us the natural means through which to read it and understand it, but two, he wants us to know him experientially, not only to have concepts of who he is, but to actually know his love towards us, know that love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And what I want to bring forward in this short message is that true Christianity, true Christianity requires both the natural uh, ability to think and the supernatural um, experiential of what is written in the Word of God, but we know it true in our hearts. For example, in 2 Timothy 2.7, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Now, what Paul is having Timothy consider is written in the Bible. It is, it is to us the word of God. So he is saying to us, consider, or the English Standard Version says, think over, ponder, ponder what is written and God will give you understanding. On the one hand, there's the natural ability to think and through that thinking, God gives spiritual understanding. And this spiritual understanding doesn't circumvent the scripture, but quite the opposite. It is seen in and through the scripture. And I want to show in um, Luke 24 how the natural understanding of scripture and God's work in our hearts work together. And then I want to show a quick example of this in the book of Romans. Now in Luke 24, we see that there is a direct link between knowing, naturally knowing scripture and genuine Christian spiritual experience. And I wanna describe three scenes in the 24th chapter of Luke. And the first scene is when early Sunday morning after Jesus had been crucified and buried, women came with spices early in the morning to the tomb and they found that the stone had been rolled away. Peering into the grave, they saw the, the body of Jesus wasn't there. And the Bible says they were perplexed. They didn't understand what was going on. And two angels appeared to them and by their question, they seemed to be perplexed about the women's perplexity. They asked, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, 
but he has risen. Then the angels point the women to some objective historical facts. They say, remember how he, Jesus, spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified, and the third day rise again. And the Bible said the women remembered his words. Scene two, on the road to Emmaus. There were two followers who were walking on the road to Emmaus, discussing with each other the, the circumstances surrounding the death of Jesus and his burial. And while they were discussing uh, amongst themselves, Jesus himself approaches and begins to travel with them. And the Bible says, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Now, this natural ability to recognize Jesus as Jesus the Nazarene was hindered by God. And Jesus asked what they were discussing. And the Bible says, they stood still, looking sad. They were downcast. They had a real sense of discouragement, maybe even depression. They had lost hope. And they said, after they had discussed some things about uh, their view of what happened, they said, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, it is the third day since these things happened. These men had a false idea who Jesus was. And not only that, they had a false idea and false expectations of what he had come to do. It appears that they had expected Jesus to come and redeem the um, nation of Israel from the pol political dominion of the Romans over them. They not only didn't recognize Jesus' face, but they did not re recognize the deeper, more important issue of who Jesus really is. They called him a prophet, mighty in deed and word. And that classification, that category, um, Elijah or Elisha or Moses could fit that. What they didn't say is who he really is, the Messiah, the Christ, God the Son, the creator of the universe, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Isn't it true also for you and I, when we have misconceptions about why God has created the earth and placed us in it and regenerated us in this fallen world and we misunderstand what our purpose is, what God's purpose is in this world, and when we do misunderstand and have false expectations that sometimes we are also perplexed, sometimes we also lose hope and even get depressed or angry and frustrated. What did Jesus say to these men? He said, oh foolish man, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scripture. It's interesting. Jesus did not say to them, he did not call them foolish men because they had not read all that the prophets had spoken. They knew the scripture. Jesus rebuked them because they were slow of heart to believe. For them, this was an issue of the heart. When they arrived at the village, they bid Jesus to stay with them. And when they sat down to eat, Jesus took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. The divine agency that had blinded them to see him physically now opened their eyes to see him physically and recognize that he is Jesus the Nazarene. 
but there is more than physical recognition that was happening here. After vanishing from their sight, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining to us the scripture, while Jesus explained the facts of the scripture, the objective facts, the historical facts pointing towards him, their hearts burned within them. Their hearts were gripped by the reality of the truth and in the inner depths of their soul. They were beginning to feel and know the truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do. They understood with their minds and they delighted and savored the truth in their hearts. Scene three in Jerusalem with the 11 apostles and others gathered together. Now we wanna remember the women who had seen the empty tomb and the angels. Now they had gone to Jerusalem and where the 11 apostles were and they told them what they had seen and heard. And the amazing thing is, is the apostle would not believe. What the women told them appeared to them to be, as the Bible says, nonsense. Then the two, men's, the, the two men came back from Emmaus, the ones that their hearts were burning within them, and they walked back to Jerusalem and found the 11 apostles gathered together, and they all were relating their experiences together. And as they were doing that, Jesus appeared among them. He appeared in their midst. And he proved to them that he physically had been raised from the dead, showing the scars in his hands and his feet. He, he asked for um, some broiled fish, which he ate, showing that he was truly um, raised bodily from the dead. They saw the physical reality, but again, Luke points out that there is something more. I go back to the scripture in Luke 24, 44. Now Jesus said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalm must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. On the one hand, he explained to them the scriptures. On the other hand, he revealed to them the reality of, the glory of, what is in and behind and comes through the scripture, that they might know the reality of God in the scriptures. Now, the opening of their minds to the reality of God was not a, re a revelation that bypassed the scriptures or circumvented the scriptures, but instead it came through reading and knowing the scriptures. God's way of giving sight of the realities of heavenly things, things that we don't see with our physical eyes, is through scripture, the Bible, the word of God. Example of Romans 5. I want to begin reading in 5, verse 3. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulation, knowing the tribulation brings about perseverance, perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. Why? Why isn't, doesn't our hope disappoint? Why can we, we be assured of our hope and we will never be disappointed by our hope? He says, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Brothers and sisters, that is an experience, having the Holy Spirit poured out within your heart by the Holy Spirit. But verse 6 shows the ground and the foundation of that experience. And it, it comes with the word for or because. We have this experience because while we were still helpless 
at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. In verse eight, but God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The ground of the experience of knowing the love of God shed abroad in our hearts is the objective truth of scripture. Why should we read the Bible? I hope that you're sensing that reason. Why should we read the Bible? In order that we might intimately know God's love for us that is revealed in and through the scripture by the enlightening work of the Holy Spirit. We prayerfully read the Bible in order to experience what the Bible reveals to us. Just as Apostle Paul said to Timothy, consider what I say for the Lord will give you understanding. Now the Bible, reading the Bible without prayer brings dead orthodoxy, dead theology and spiritual pride. Prayer without the Bible brings spiritual error we can be moved by impressions and feelings and tossed here and there with every wind of doctrine, and it produces spiritual pride. But what brings reality of the scripture is prayerfully reading the Bible. And by prayerfully praying things like the psalmist in Psalm 119, 18, where he prays, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things in your law. Or Psalm 119, 38, establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Do you lack reverence for God? Do you um, live your life ignoring who he is? All of us do to one extent or another. The solution is to prayerfully read the word of God. It's a discipline. We don't always want to. But if we know the underlying purpose for why he has given the word of God to us, that we might see in and through the word of God as a window, seeing something of his glory. And as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, as we see his glory in and through the word of God, we see his glory, we are changed from glory to glory. I'd like to pray for us right now that not only we be drawn to his word, but that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would be revealed the realities of his word in us and through us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, for it is living and alive, is sharper than any two-edged sword. And we pray, Father, that you would draw each and every one of us to your word and that you would open our eyes that we might see wonderful things about you and actually come to know you experientially and that we would grow in that grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we would be changed from glory to glory, evermore enjoying and reveling in your awesome glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.